All right, so, so take your Bibles now and turn to John chapter 6, okay? John chapter 6. Over in the venue, turn to John chapter 6. If you're watching online, you're at home, Bibles, John chapter 6. If you don't own a Bible, all you have to do is go into the altar room and we'll give you one. There's an altar room over in the, the, the venue and we'll, we'll give you one. One of the great things about the Bible is that this is a book that reminds us of uh, all the things that God has already told us. Like, look, look I, I, don't, I don't speak for God. God's already spoken, okay? And what this time here is, is really a, a time to remember what God has said. I, I have nothing new to add to this. There, there's no new revelation here, folks. When you come to church or you go to a Bible study or you go to your small group or whatever it is, it's a time when we remember what the Lord has already spoken to us about. And we are in a study where we're going through the book of John together, remembering God's word there. And before I get into it, let me, let me give us a quick reminder of what we looked at last Weekend. Last weekend, we looked at the miracle of the feeding of 15,000. Jesus took a, a young boy's sack lunch. There were five little loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed 5,000 men. And as I said last week, you got 5,000 men, you probably got 5,000 women, and then you probably got another 5,000 children. So it was really the feeding of the 15,000 people. Now, in our text today, our story today, it, it, it takes place right after that. So Jesus feeds all of the people, and this is what happens next, okay? Look, look at John chapter 6, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, and that's the Sea of Galilee, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. There, there, there's a storm happening. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he, Jesus, said to them, It is I, don't, don't be afraid. And they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. So what do we learn in these six verses right here? Why, why did God have John remember this moment in history? John writes his gospel decades after this took place. Jesus has promised the guys, listen, I'm going to bring back to your, rem your remembrance everything that I, I want you to write. Why, why did God choose this story? Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3? He said, all scripture, which obviously includes the story that I just read, right? is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it. God uses the word. God uses those six verses that we just read to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So what do these six verses teach us? What, what, what can we learn from this story? Well, it teaches us a, a lot of things, but I'm going to give you just a, a, a few big ones, okay? Number one, the story teaches us about obedience to God and his word. That's the first thing. In other words, it was the will of God that these disciples get into the boat and head out into the middle of the lake, and they did it. In Mark's account of this story, he gives us a, a little bit more, more detail. It says this in Mark chapter 6. Immediately after this, immediately after he feeds the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. Jesus insisted 
A lot of your Bibles, you're reading it right now, uh, use the word made. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. In other words, this wasn't the disciples' idea. They had just watched Jesus feed 15,000 people with a sack lunch. I have no doubt that they wanted to hang out with Jesus. They didn't want to go anywhere. They wanted to be with him. There's no way they went, wow, that was amazing. You just you know, fed 15,000 people with a sack lunch. Hey, guys, let's get out of here. Come on, let's go. No way. They wanted to hang out. They wanted to be around the man. It was Jesus who insisted, guys, I know you want to hang out with me, but I want you to get in that boat. Guys, I'm making you get in. I know you want to be with me. But that's not my will. My will is you get into that boat and you row out in the middle of the, of the sea. Now this may seem like a, a minor point, but it's not. You see, we need to be like these men. They were obedient. Jesus told them to do something and they did it. They followed his instructions. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 28. He said, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because I got all authority, I want you to go and make disciples of all the nations. I want you to baptize these new disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. It's not simply enough to hear the word of God taught. God wants you to actually do it or live it out or be obedient. Jesus says, guys, you're going to go and you're going to teach people to obey all that I have taught you. I found this verse in Jeremiah that I think really captures the heart of a lot of people, unfortunately, that come to church and they claim to know the Lord and they claim to love his word. Jeremiah 6 says, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and then walk in it. In other words, do it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. No, thank you. I'm not getting in the boat. I don't care what you say. I'm the CEO of my life. Don't tell me what to do. I'm going to live life the way I want to live it. When you, when you hear the word of God preached or you read the word of God on your own or whatever, do you have a desire to actually do it? There's a, a great story found in 1 Samuel chapter 15 about the importance of obedience, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Most of us know the story. Some of you don't, but it's really a weighty story. One day, Samuel, and he was a, a, a judge or a prophet, said to Saul, and Saul was the king of Israel. In fact, Saul was the first king of Israel. It was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people Israel. Now listen to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's army has declared. I've decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire uh, Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, Camels and donkeys. If you got a half a cell working, God was crystal clear, right? If you got one of these in your hand, God's crystal clear. His will, you know, isn't hidden in a cave somewhere or under a bush. He, he makes things pretty clear. And here he makes it pretty clear. 
So Saul mobilized his army at uh, uh, Telam, where there were 200,000 soldiers from Israel and 10,000 men from uh, uh, Judah. Then Saul and the army went to the town of the Amalekites and lay in wait in the valley. So far, so good. Saul sent this warning to the Kenites. Move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the uh, uh, Kenites packed up and they left. Or the Kenites, however you want to say it. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Haval all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fatted calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? That's not what God said, was it? Hmm. Saul's going rogue here. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Verse 10 says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul, this ought to be interesting. Someone told him, Saul, when uh, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. <laughs> then he went to Gilgal. And when Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's commands. Then what is all the bleeding of the sheep and goats and the lowing of the cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. Hey, welcome! Glad you're here! <laughs> hey, what's that? Saul? What's all that noise I'm hearing? Hmm. It is true that the army spared the best of the sheep and the goats and the cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. But we've destroyed everything else. Not a bad plan, right? Just not God's plan. Hmm. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. Well, what did he tell you? And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the, the, the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? You see, anytime you disobey God, it's evil. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everything else. Then, then my troops brought the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Now he's throwing his troops under the bus. Not me. It's the woman you gave me. Man, this, is, this is as old as the first two human beings. And we've all done it. We've all, you know, pushed the blame somewhere else. Listen, his soldiers wouldn't have done anything without his approval. He was the king. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifice or your obedience to his voice? Listen. 
Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness is bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, because you've been disobedient, he has rejected you as king. Oh, that's brutal. Obedience matters to God. And by the way, dads, we get that, right? I mean, if, our, if we tell our kids to do something and they don't do it, that's not good, is it right? If I tell my son, hey, son, I want you to go out and mow the front yard. And he goes out and he mows three quarters of it, but he leaves a quarter. Hey, dad. I, I did three quarters of it, but I decided not to do the, the last bit because the neighbor's got a goat, and I decided to let the goat eat the rest of the stuff, man. <laughs> oh, well, son, that, that, that's not a bad thing, but it isn't what I told you to do. I didn't tell you to leave a third of it up so the goats could come over and eat the rest of it. I told you to mow the whole thing. I'm your father. When you get to be an adult, you can leave a third of it up for the goats. I don't care, but, but this is my home. I'm dad here. I expect you to do what I ask you to do. I think, I think you could put it this way. I've kind of rewrote maybe how it ends here, how this story ends. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Reading the word? Meditating on the word, memorizing the word, or your obedience to actually living out the word. Obedience is better than reading or meditating or memorizing. Look, I'm not saying that it isn't good to read or memorize or meditate on the word. I'm not saying that. But what's important is, is that when you hear God's commands, that you actually go out and live it. That you don't go, well, you know, here's the deal. Uh, wow, I don't, that right there I don't really like all that much, so I'm going to blow that one off. Here's the bottom line. The, the disciples were given a command from Jesus. Get into that boat and row to the other side of the lake. And they did it. They obeyed. And all of us need to be like the disciples. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He said, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep and those of us that are his sheep, we, we listen to his voice, right? This is the voice of the Lord right here. One of the characteristics of a follower of Jesus Christ is they, they get into the word, they read the word, they meditate on the word, whatever all those things are, because this is the voice of God, but it doesn't stop there. The last little line there is, and they follow me. In other words, they actually do it. They obey it. They live it out. There's a lot of people out there that read the word, but they don't follow it. They don't live it out. Look, sitting here and listening to truth is easy, isn't it? Hey, going home and, and, and reading the word is easy. It's easy. Anybody can do that. Anybody can sit in here and listen to truth. Anybody can sit over in the venue and listen to truth. Anybody can watch online and, and hear truth. That's easy. The hard part is getting up out of your chair and actually going out and living it out. That's where the rubber meets the road. So the first thing we learn from this story is that it was God's will that they get into the boat and they did it. They obeyed. The second thing we learn is this. The story teaches us that God allows everybody to experience tough times. In other words, it was the will of God that the storm would come right when the men got out into the middle of the lake. Look at verse 18. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Remember, it was Jesus that sent them out into the middle of the lake. It was God's will that they get in that boat and go out into the middle of that lake. 
Jesus knew a storm was coming. He caused the storm. Listen, sometimes problems, storms, uh, difficult times come into our lives because we disobey the Lord, right? Jonah is a pretty good example of that. He literally ran from the Lord and he paid a pretty good price for it. Or, uh, or, or King, King Saul, who we just read, right? He disobeyed the Lord and he paid a heavy price for it. I know of a lot of people that have disobeyed God's will and had, I don't know, sex with somebody they weren't married to and a storm hit their life, right? They got a sexually transmitted disease or there was a, a pregnancy that they you know, didn't, didn't, didn't want. In other words, there was a price that they paid for their disobedience. I, I know people that disobeyed the clear teaching of the Bible, God's will as it relates to money. And they, they spent money that they didn't have on stuff they didn't need to impress people they don't even like. And now they can't make all their payments. They're paying a price for disobeying what the will of God is. But the other side of the coin is this. Sometimes storms come into our lives when we do exactly what Jesus tells us to do. These guys are out in the middle of the lake with a storm all around them because they obeyed the Lord. They were right in the middle of God's will, you see. Jesus said this in John chapter 16. He said, in this world you will have troubles. Everybody's going to have troubles. It doesn't say in this world only disobedient people will have troubles. That's not what God's word says. God says that in this lifetime, this side of glory, the standard equipment of life is troubles. They're going to come. Troubles and and sorrows and heartache and hard times are are just, just a part of life. Everybody experiences them. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor or you're black or you're white or you're male or you're female or you're single or you're married. Nobody's exempt, exempt from the troubles or difficult times in life. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5. He, that's God, causes the sun to rise on good people and on evil people. And he sends rain to those who do right and to those who do wrong. In other words, let me give you an illustration. Over here, you got a farmer. And uh, he's planted corn. And he doesn't know the Lord from Howard Hughes. And over here, you got another farmer right down the road. Loves the Lord deeply. Cares about God and his word. And he's planted corn. And God allows that big red ball to come up every day and heat those fields, causes it to rain, so all that seed gets rain. They're both enjoying all these common graces of God, and now their crops are growing. This guy over here doesn't love Jesus. He hates the church, man. He he uses God's name in vain. This guy over here loves the Lord deeply, committed to the church, serves in the church, and here's their corn growing. All because of God. And then, all of a sudden, this guy down here, a bunch of locusts come into his corn, and the locusts wipe him out. And this guy over here, his corn grew, chopped it down, went to market, he made a fortune. Happens all the time. Some of you that are farmers in here, it's happened to you, right? Pagan down the road made a fortune this year. And for whatever reason, your, your trees didn't, the cherries bumped into each other and there's no, you got nothing, right? That's what, that's what Jesus is saying here in this verse. In other words, everybody is going to experience good times. Everybody will experience bad times. Good people go through tough times. Bad people go through 
tough times. Christians go through tough times and non-Christian people go through tough times. In other words, difficult times are impartial. Disasters, tragedies happen to all of us. No one's immune from them. No one's insulated from pain and sorrow. No one gets to, you know, skate through life. Nobody. Even when you love Jesus and you walk in his will. Think about Job. He was a godly man. He loved God deeply. But for whatever reason, God allowed him to go through some really, really crummy times, right? All this to say, obedience to God doesn't prevent storms in our lives. But it does give us the power to overcome those storms. It does give us the security within those storms, and it does build our trust when the storms come. In fact, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Everybody who hears these words and obeys, It's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. It rained hard, man. The storms are coming. The, the floods came and the winds blew and hit that house, but it did not fall. Oh, there were some shingles that came loose and the front door is on one hinge now and a window got blown out. You go through a storm, you know, there, there's some stuff happens, but it's still there because the person heard the word and obeyed it. He goes on and says, everyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. It rained hard, the floods came and the winds blew and hit that house and it fell with a big crash. What a, what a great illustration, right? I mean, we, we all get that. You got two people who built a house One person built their house on simply hearing the word. They had a Bible. It was sitting on their coffee table. They may have even come to church. They might have gone to a small group. They might have memorized all kinds of stuff. But they didn't live it out. They didn't obey it. And this guy over here, he built the house too. He heard the word, memorized it. But the key was he did it. He built it. Both homes experienced troubles. Both homes went through storms. And one house survived. And that was the obedient house, if, if you will. So it was uh, God's will for the men to get into the boat, and it was his will for them to experience a, a storm. But something really great happens in the story. It's the third point. The story teaches us that Jesus is always near when you go through a storm. Okay, in other words, Jesus actually meets you in the middle of the storms. Look at verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the, the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three, three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat. Jesus is right there. He's right in the middle of the storm. He sent the guys out. It was his will. You get out there, guys. The storm comes. They're right in the middle of the, uh, God's will, and here he is. Here's Jesus now, right in the middle of the storm. And they were terrified, it says. Listen to what King David said. See if anybody can relate. He said, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where, where there's no foothold. I've come into the deep waters. The the floods engulf me. I'm worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My my eyes fail looking for my God. Anybody ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you were going under for the last time? This is exactly, I think, how the disciples felt. Man, they're going under. This is a bad storm. They were scared. I love the thought here. My my throat is parched. 
King David said. In other words, man, I've been crying out for so long. My throat's not even working anymore. You ever got to that point where life, the storms have gotten to the point where, where you can't even cry anymore, or you try, but just nothing's coming out. No tears. What do you do when your marriage is in deep water? What do, what, do, what do you do when your teenager's gone sideways and there's a storm in your home? What, what, what do you do when your, your parents are divorcing? What, what, what do you do when, when they find a lump, you know, where there's not supposed to be a lump and there's this unbelievable health storm that's now swirling in your personal life, your family? What do you do when you're in over your head? Well, Listen to what God said through the great prophet Isaiah. Now he's talking to the nation of Israel in its context. But there's application for us. He says, but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I've called you by name. You're mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in uh, in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid, I am with you. That's just a really great promise that we need to remember. When you're in over your head, when the, when the floods come, when the unexpected crisis hits your life or your marriage or your business or whatever, this passage basically gives us two great thoughts. Number one, relax and take a deep breath. God says, don't be afraid. Don't get uptight. Don't get worried because you belong to me. I've got you. I've got a plan for your life. And beloved, God's plan for your life is always greater than the problems you're going through. God's purpose for your life is always more significant and more powerful than the problems you're facing. Yes, you're having a problem. Yes, it's a crisis. But God says, look, Don't be afraid. Just relax. Don't be afraid. And the second thing I kind of took from this little passage in Isaiah is this. Remember that God is with you. Here's the deal. When your marriage goes through deep waters and great troubles, God says, remember, I'm with you. In other words, you're not going through it alone. When your teenager goes sideways, look, God says, I am with you. I'm with you through this. When, when your business isn't doing very well and you, you, you don't think you're going to be able to make payroll, you know, God, God says, hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. You're not going to go through that alone. When the doctor on Friday says, hey, listen, we got this lump, but I can't tell you what it is for another week. Got to come back. We, 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 we can put a guy on the moon. We got a car on the moon. A doctor can't say, look, got a lump, let me tell you what it is right now. No, that's not how they do it. Hey, you got a lump, come back next week and we'll tell you what's going on. What? I talked with a woman last night, on Friday, got the news, there's a lump, come back next week, we'll tell you what it is. So guess what? Here's a storm. What? And they're a young couple, she's married. Hey. Hey. God's with you in this thing. You're not alone. Yes, you got your husband, praise God. Been married about a year. Thank God for him. But guess what? He's, riding, he's on the boat with you. He's nervous too. The Lord is with both of you. Don't forget that. Look, here's the deal. When you're in a storm, you may get wet. You may take on some water. You may bump your forehead on a bench. You may cough up a bunch of water but you're not going to drown. You're not going to. Because the Lord is with you. 
You just need to say, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you to see us through this. Isaiah uses the word through. Look look at verse uh, 2 of Isaiah 43. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you won't drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you won't be burned. He doesn't say when you go over the floods or around the floods. He says when you go through the floods because sometimes the only way to go through something is you got to go through it. Just the way it is. This life, you're going to have troubles. But remember, as you go through whatever it is you go through, Jesus is going to meet you right in the middle of that thing. So we've learned that it was the will of God that the disciples get into the boat and head out in the middle of the lake, and they did it. And we've learned that everybody will experience storms in their life. And we've learned that when you go through storms or difficult times, Jesus is right there with you. Now, now let me tell you why this is so important. Let me tell you why it's important to relax and take a deep breath and remember that God is with you when the storms of life hit. Okay, it's number four. I'll give you number four. The story teaches us that fear always keeps you from recognizing Jesus. You know, fear is, a, is an ugly thing. It's a powerful thing. They thought Jesus was a, a ghost or something. Their, their fear kept them from recognizing him in the middle of the storm. And that can easily happen to us. There have been many times in my own personal life, even as a pastor, where I've been in a storm, uh, the stuff is happening. And, and you know what? I was just afraid. And whenever I get afraid, I forget that the Lord is with me. It's weird what fear does. All of a sudden, all you do is start focusing in on whatever's happening in your life. You're focusing in on the waves and the the stuff because you're afraid. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me when they're in the middle of a storm And they'll say to me, Pastor Rick, I feel like God is a million miles away. I feel like God isn't listening to me anymore. I'll bet you you've said that. Because it's just what happens. The storms of life come and we get afraid of the outcomes or what's going to happen. And so we immediately forget that Jesus is there. He's in the middle of, of the, 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 the storm. Let me ask you, what, what, what command do you think is repeated more often in the Bible than any other command? Don't commit murder? That'd be a good guess. How about don't commit adultery? That'd be a pretty good guess also. But Jesus said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. That's it. That's the number one command in Scripture. You read it over and over and over again. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Literally, that phrase is sprinkled throughout the Bible. And the reason why you find it everywhere is because God knows us. He knows that in this life, we're going to have troubles. In this life, you know what? We could be right in the middle of God's will and we're going to experience troubles in our lives. And when that happens, we're going to get afraid. And God says, listen, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't don't you be afraid. I'm with you. You're not going through this alone. In Daniel chapter 3, we're we're told the story of these three young men that were sentenced to die by being bound up and thrown into a a really hot furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of you know the story. It says this in in, uh, verse 24. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king, jumped up. Okay, they, they, they've, got, they've got the three guys and they've thrown them into the fire. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, hey, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? It's kind of a rhetorical question. It was Shadrach, right? Meshach and Abednego, right? Yeah. Got those guys tied up, we threw them in the fire, right? Yeah. There was three. Yeah. Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. They replied, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men. 
There are four men in that storm. There are four men in that fire. There are four men in that difficult situation. Unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And by the way, the fourth guy looks like a god. Doesn't look like Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. I got the feeling when those guys are all tied up and they're being thrown into the fire, God said, don't be afraid, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You don't have to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah, it looks hot. Woo, it's going to be hot. Well, I'm going to blow your minds because I'm in the middle of it. Whoop. Next thing you know, they're all in there walking around, you know, hey, what's happening? You know, and everybody's looking in going, what, what? The fourth guy wasn't a pastor. The fourth guy wasn't, you know, some spiritual guru. The fourth guy, you know, wasn't, you know, a good buddy, someone in their small group. Wasn't somebody around their table, their men's table group. Fourth guy, without a doubt, in the midst of that particular storm, if you will, was the Lord. He was with them. And that's the reality for God's children, us. I don't care what you're going through. You got to keep your eye on him because fear is the thing that will just get you goofed up. See, one of the beautiful things about coming to church or say going to your small group or coming to men or going to women's ministries is it's a time when we get to remember truth. See, you can come in here and man, you're in a storm, everything's going on, then all of a sudden you start fellowshipping, and the next thing you know, you start singing, and the next thing you know, you're following the Lord, and you're giving your offering, and the next thing you know, you're praying, and the next thing you know, you're hearing the word of God, and for an hour and a half, your mind is on him. You're not thinking about the storm that's going on. But you know what? You're gonna get in your car, and you're gonna drive home, and there's gonna be that doctor's slip, there's going to be, you know, your, your, your teenager, or it could be your parents that are, you know, your dad's not living in the house. Storm's still there. But for an hour, an hour and a half in here with men, with women, with whatever it is, wow, you got your eyes on the one who says to you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because as we walk through this thing called life, wow. And maybe I'm the only one. I get afraid. There are many times when things are happening and I just, I just get afraid. I get all nervous and I get a headache and I just get all goofed up. And I'm very thankful for church and times when I'm studying the word Times I get together with my small group or whatever it is and all of a sudden my mind is taken to where it needs to go on him. And he's the one who reminds me, Rick, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Why don't you all stand? Everybody over in the venue, why don't you stand and let, let me end our time by praying. And so, Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, our time here this morning, and thank you for the report on camp and how you're working in our kids' lives, Lord. Next hour, the room that they meet in is just, there's just kids hanging outside the doors, just jammed up. I'm thankful, God for our youth teams, mentoring kids. I'm thankful, God, that we had a chance just to recognize the gals of our church and to pray for them. I'm grateful, God, that we gave people a chance to be generous and bring you a gift. I'm grateful for all of the servants here that are working with children and youth and, and their ushers and greeters and they work in the music ministries and just so many, Lord. So grateful for them all. 
Lord, I'm thankful for your word because without it, there's no point in us being here, I guess. Uh, I, I, we wouldn't know much about you. We wouldn't know about Jesus. So thank you for the scriptures. May we be a church that's committed to not only reading it and, and all of that and studying it and memorizing it and meditating on it, but Lord, may we be people that are obedient to it. I sure look forward to next weekend, God. We, we just want to tell people about you. So we come up with some special times, Lord. And I know I've invited a few people, and I hope when I talk to them this next week that they say yes. They, they've said no to many Easter's and many Christmases, God, but maybe, maybe next weekend's the weekend that they'd come. I'm not giving up on them, Lord, because you don't. We're crazy about you, Jesus, and we just want to tell people about you. So I look forward to next weekend if you should tear your coming. And I, I pray these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, Lord bless you. Okay, live for Christ.